The security camera from inside the military cargo truck commandeered by Wayland Forth, the creator of the Geneva virus, Danielle Scott, the security guard, Alexandria Krupenikova, the military receptionist, and Sergeant Gonzalez, the world's last self-conscious Superman, depicts the team after their narrow escape from the overrun military base. Scott is driving them southbound along the motorway, passing unsuspecting traffic, hundreds and thousands of people heading unknowingly into a catastrophic danger zone of which the hope of escape is unlikely. Wayland is deep in thought staring out of the passenger window as the sergeant comforts Alexandria in his huge arms. Ugh, I'm starving. Me too. When can we stop? I'm dying for food. Oh, are we nearly there yet? No, we've only just left the base. When are we gonna eat? Later, we have to get ahead of this thing. Looks like we are ahead. Those are all reinforcements heading to the base. And those are military choppers. Boeing AH-64 Apaches, if my hearing doesn't fail me. We have to warn the people somehow. Alert the country. Don't worry. I think it will be all over social network by morning. Hey, Guns. Do you know what a mop is? A uh, what? Uh, no. What is it? Okay, how about an M35 2.5 ton? An M35 2.5 ton cargo truck. That's the truck we're in. Interesting. What's with the weird questions? Just a theory. How about a shoehorn? I don't know. A noisy shoe? Where are we headed anyway? Folkestone. It's a Folkestone? The only way of stopping this thing from taking Europe. The Channel Tunnel. Wayland was convinced that when the infected spread to the airports and ferry docks, there would be no danger of the virus progressing as an infected pilot would no longer be capable of flight. I checked the footage from Farnborough Airport to corroborate this theory, and indeed, the infected flood into the halls, pass over security in waves, murdering and infecting as they go. Finally, they reach the gates and run into the available docked planes. The cockpit surveillance footage shows that the pilots leave the cabin at the sound of the commotion, rather than try to fly away. Anyway, back to the army cargo truck after having refueled both petrol and food. How are we doing back there? I'm pumped. Well, we can see that. No, I mean, I've been itching for these sort of situations ever since I got powered up. It's exciting! I know, right? I've been stuck as a boring security guard in a pretty tight military base where nothing ever happens, and suddenly this is it. It's all over. Everything we know is over. All laws, taxes are not going to mean anything real soon. We're going to have to hunt and build fires and find water, surviving just using our own wits. I'm pumped too, Guns! And you, Jane? Cold. Really cold. I definitely weren't prepared for an apocalypse this morning when I chose this skirt. On hearing this, Guns' muscular embrace tightens, but doesn't appear to help Alexandria. That's not actually helping. You're cold. Like a lizard. She puts her hand on one of his meaty pectorials. You're colder than me. He'd give you his coat if he could, but all he's got is pants. Ha <laughs> ha. It must be the organic neoprene you mentioned, keeping your body heat in. I suppose it's more efficient, if anything. Here, Jane, put on my lab coat. You can sit up front. Scott, put the heater on for her. Thanks, Doctor. Just Wayland. Wayland, that's very thoughtful of you. She clambers into the front and guns hunches angrily, his face set hard. Cock blocker. Guns. What's your real name? I can't just keep calling you Guns the whole time. Francisco Javier López González. Okay, Guns. I'm interested. You said they heightened your intelligence. That's right. I got the scars to prove it. See? Look at my head. Mm. They disabled our pain center and made us more loyal. Yes, I see. And ten times cleverer. More cleverer. Cleverer. Although, you've got scars all over the cerebral cortex. Not just the parietal lobe. How did they make you more loyal? I don't know. They were very pleased with the results of the last stop. Said we'd kill our own family without blinking if they ordered it. Wayland was left staring into space deep in thought. His face starts to gleam with sweat, leaving a more than uncomfortable silence that guns interrupts. Uh, sir, are you okay? But Wayland is panting heavily, apparently entranced, perhaps lost in memory. Was it something I said? On playing back the footage, I see that Wayland freezes up just when Guns mentions killing his own family. It reminds me of a similar moment I had found when delving into Wayland's past. The records show that Wayland was an only son whose father left the family when he was just a boy. The interesting thing is, 
that Wayland named the Doomsday Virus after his mother, Geneva. It appears that they had a precarious relationship, as according to a police report, they had a big quarrel one night and Geneva Fourth had stormed out, leaving town never to return. Not long after, some smart TV footage shows Wayland working in a makeshift lab in his living room, manipulating all sorts of chemicals with quite a few cages scattered about the table, containing a pair of budgies, a hamster, and a black cat. He opens the budgie's cage and quickly grabs one of the birds before it can fly, and with a scalpel makes a small incision along its back. Hours later, the cut appears to have healed, but 24 hours later, the bird is dead. Wayland seems to freeze, perhaps thinking about the same thing as in the back of the army truck, holding his head in his hand and silently hyperventilating. It's like he's in a trance. We've got any water. it wake him up. <laughs> That's the point. We haven't got any supplies. We need to find some before the mass chaos begins. What? what? Why, why have we stopped? Ah, welcome back, General. You're in a trance. Look, you're drenched in sweat. We can't afford to stop. The virus won't. There's roughly 120 miles from the base to Folkestone, so in 12 hours it will reach the tunnel and two hours have already passed. So there's only 10 left. Scott casually clambers back into the driver's seat. That's plenty of time. We're only like 10 minutes away. We just need to get supplies. Jane, is there any water in the glove box? But how are we going to shut the tunnel? The miniature ones could get through even the smallest holes. Guns, what does that box say that you're sitting on? Service soul. From here it reads, explosives. Scott pulls the truck into a surprisingly busy service station. The pumps are all occupied, people bulk buying drinks and snacks, and others waiting, huddled around a TV screen. Looks like the news has already got out. Be described as zombies. Could this be the zombie apocalypse? The Prime Minister's initiated an emergency curfew in the whole of southern England and urges citizens to remain indoors at all costs. Suddenly, Jane screams as something from within the glove box grabs onto her hand. After shaking it vigorously, a mouse-sized naked man lands on her chest and then darts into her cleavage to escape her flailing hands. Ah! It's Oh my god, it's spithy! Guns in a heartbeat pulls back her seat, breaking the reclining mechanism, rips open her shirt. Hey! Oh my god! What the spithy! Get out of there, you pervert! and throws the man out of the window into the crowded service station. <gasps> oh my god! I'm sorry, I had to protect you. Forget 10 hours, the new ATA is half an hour. Will they reach the tunnel before the infected? What was the government doing about the threat? More discoveries to come next time on Before the Aftermath. Join us on Patreon and get emailed each weekly episode a day before it goes public. Even feature in the episodes as a zombie, or even a main character. Check out all the other rewards. Click it.